All right, folks, what we've been going over, you know, last couple weeks, we've had some breaks and some disjointedness in here, but it's the birth and the spread of Islam, something that is in the news quite frequently um, these days. And before Islam was invented, here in, give me one second, I've got to shut the door here. Before Islam was invented, Saudi Arabia was in what we call the crossroads of the world right, world right here, connecting Africa with Asia and Europe. And there are a lot of trade routes going through here um, from the Byzantine Empire, the Spice Road, the Silk Road, the trans sahara trade route ran right through here, which made it a gathering place for many people. The town of Mecca, before Islam, was a big trading plantation center. It also, as a result of the trading going on, had a big shrine where people would come to worship. It was a one-stop shopping where you could, you know, shop and worship you know, your different polytheistic gods from Africa, from Asia, from parts of Europe at the same time. And it is here in this trading oasis that you needed to know what to say to someone that would not offend them. When you're trying to bring them into your store, what can you say, what might or might not be offensive? So you had to know a little bit about every background to try and entice them into your um, store. This area of the world is also home to two of the other great monotheistic religions, uh, the foundation of Judaism, on which is Christianity, upon which is built Islam. So this area was known, all right? The Hebrew God, Yahweh, the Christian God, who was God, and Allah come from this region. A lot of people outside of the Jews and the Christians believed in mono or, or polytheistic gods, not one monotheistic God like Allah. And it is here we get the central figure to, to Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, who was born around 570 A.D. to a small, you know, poor family. He was orphaned very young, and he was adopted by a lower middle class trading family, where he grows up doing a lot of work. Eventually, he will marry his wife Khadija, who is a widower of a large wealthy merchant, and Muhammad takes over the business. And while there, being the front person trying to get people to come into his trading business, he gets disgusted at all the worldliness and the paganism going on around him, what it takes to bring people into the store. So Muhammad uh, will study for a while with Hebrew rabbi. He gets some of the answers, but not all of them. Then Muhammad goes to study with Christian scholars and gets some more answers. And he eventually goes out into a cave by himself where he does 40 days and he meditates where he meets um, and is spoken to God's messenger angel, the archangel Gabriel, who tells him, Muhammad, you are the last in a long line of, of prophets. You are going to warn people of their idolatry and their wickedness. You are going to remind them to worship me, the one true God, Allah. And what is significant about this is that Gabriel is speaking to Muhammad in his language of Arabic. Like the Hebrew prophets got the, the, the word in their language, so does Allah. And he has the last chance to bring people over to him. And what Muhammad is told by, by Allah is that he is to spread the message of God. Muslims do believe in the other Old Testament prophets, Noah, Abraham, Moses. They also view Jesus as another prophet, not the Son of God, but as a, a prophet. And what you have to do is worship Allah and only Allah, the one true God, and get rid of your other practices. And so... The word Islam means submitter to God. You give yourself over to, to God. So Muhammad begins to try and gain converts. 
Unfortunately, he does not have success early on in Mecca, and he and his followers is, are sent out of the city for their safety. Muhammad will travel to the city of Medina or Medina, where he will gain a large following, will eventually become known as the Islamic Ummah. So, as we start going on, Muhammad's writings will be written down in a, in, into a book known as the um, Quran. And it lays out what you are and what you are not to do. Um, this will eventually become known as the Sharia or the, the you know, binding law, the canon law, if you will, of Islam. As that continues, one of the things that um, is powerful about Islam and its spread is that its ease of practice. And in Medina, the basic, basic norms of society will take place. You are not to drink, you are not to gamble, you are not to eat pork. You must live your life in accordance. You must, what, how you are in public is how you must also be in private. And one of the things that attracts people to Islam is Judaism has the Ten Commandments in the Torah. Christianity has the Ten Commandments and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, but when it comes to practicing Islam, there are only five things um, that you have to do. Number one is you've got to ask forgiveness before you worship. Absolution before worship. Number two is you have to pray five times a day in the direction of Mecca. Number three you must um, tithe, you must give to um, the poor and the lowly, orphans, poor women. You can see Muhammad's early life showing back up here. Um, number four is the practice of Ramadan, where you do not eat or drink um, anything during daylight hours for 40 days. And Ramadan will travel throughout um, the months of the year to symbolize Muhammad being out in the desert and getting your body ready for forgiveness. And the last one is the Hajj, or the pilgrimage to the city of Mecca, once in your life, if you are able. Those are the five pillars of, of Islam. Now, Muhammad was the central figure, but after he dies or ascends, the big question is, who is going to take over Islam? And we come up with the idea of, of the caliph, the political and the religious leader of, of Islam. The first one is one of Muhammad's oldest converts, Abu Bakr. And he will lead and continue Islam through its dynamic spread. In over 100 years, they will spread from the Loire River in France all the way to the Indus River Valley. of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. Ali and Muawina are the first five caliphs. A lot of people don't have a problem listening to them because they personally knew Muhammad. They were guys that were like Jesus' 12 apostles. They lived with him, they ate with him, they talked with him. They had that deep connection to Muhammad. Eventually, however, as Islam spreads, there is going to be an Islamic schism or a split. While they all believe the same thing and worship the same way, the big question becomes, who is the, is the caliph? And we get two distinct separations. There are Shiite or Shia Muslims, today found primarily in Iran, who believe the true caliph must be a blood descendant of Muhammad. Muhammad didn't have any sons, but he did have a daughter, Fatima. So the leader of Shiite Islam Muhammad was picked for a reason. His blood is special, so he must be the, the leader. The majority of Muslims in the world today are Sunnis, and they believe the caliph or the leader must be the best Muslim possible in their um, communities. A few things to just to throw in. Khadijah is Muhammad's um, wife and first convert. And early on, contrary to, to today, women had a high level of rights and privileges in early Islamic um, society. Um, the first five caliphs, Islam will spread from the Atlantic Ocean up into Iran over to India, one of the fastest spreading religions of all time. Number one, 
due to the original leadership. Number two, Muslims were seen as liberators. Um, other empires of the world were the Byzantine Empire in Turkey and the Sassanid Empire in what is today Iran, who heavily taxed their people to fight their wars. The Muslims were seen as liberators. Also, if you converted to Islam, you were welcomed into the, into the family, you were protected, and you didn't pay taxes. Jews and Christians, or people considered people of the book or scripture, were able to practice their religions. They did have to pay a small um, head tax. So Islam expands quicker and faster than any religion in, in history. And eventually, to keep the doctrine together, the Islamic Sharia is written. It is the governing body, the canon law, as I said, um, that governs all facets of Islamic life. Your social, your political, your commercial, and your social life. And from this, we get the third sect of Muslims, the Sufi Muslims, who were missionaries, who were more adaptable. They spread the religion eastward and were able to adapt or adopt local shrines or religions into the concept or the framework of, um, of Islam. And Islam is not just a religion, it's the third monotheistic religion, but it is also a, a culture. And Islamic achievements are great. They preserved a lot of the Greco-Roman learning that was um, destroyed. A lot of work in, in early algebra. Um, great iron working and being able to use acid to make intricate designs on metal. Mosaic art and architecture. The, the minaret where the call to prayer is, is led from and pioneering ideas in science and medicine, like stitching, cleanliness, coming to a wound. Uh, Dr. Al-Razi hung pieces of meat throughout the city, and he found out the meat rotted slower where parts of the city were clean. So when it comes to cleanliness and antiseptic, when it comes to hospitals, and also a good bedside manner, a, a cheerful doctor or a smile can help a, a patient heal. All of this was preserved or added on to education when the Western European world had devolved into what we knew as the Dark Ages. It's a very, very quick synopsis of, of early Islam. We will get back to it soon. Thanks for listening and watching, guys.